So um, today's session, as you know, is about the challenges that life poses to teenagers these days. Uh, and what we as teachers can do to help them with the development of vital life skills. Let's have a quick look at the content that I'm going to cover in this uh, session today. We'll start out by looking at some research, some recent research findings about the challenges that teenagers face um, uh, these days. We'll discuss what life skills are and why we should develop them in uh, the English language teaching class. We will then look at resilience as one of the core life skills and five things to know about uh, developing it. And, and finally, and this is of course important, this is not um, um, a commercial uh, session about the second edition of Think, but I am of course delighted to have the opportunity to illustrate what I'm going to uh, be talking about with a few practical examples from the new course. For at least 2,500 years, adults have blamed the younger generation for their behavior. Here is an example from a British newspaper from the 1920s, I quote, we defy anyone who goes about with his eyes open to deny that there is, as never before, an attitude on the part of younger folk, which is best described as grossly thoughtless, rude, and utterly selfish. This comes um, from a newspaper from 1925, and the the, the article was titled The Conduct of uh, Young uh, People. The tendency to, to blame young people has, I think, been um, replaced in recent years by a growing understanding of the difficulties brought about by the transition period that teenagers go through. Their bodies change, the hormones play havoc. Life can be an emotional roller coaster, and many of them feel enormous insecurity and stress when they think of having to succeed in a future that seems ever more threatening. This has led to some experts raising their warning voice that we are talking a whole generation in crisis. And I would like to quote um, Dr. Carol Easton here. She is the chief executive of the Young Women's uh, Trust charity. And she says, make no mistake, we are talking about a generation of young people in crisis. It's not in any of our interests to write off an entire um, generation. Let us first have a look at a number of recent studies into this subject. No doubt you will have made your own observations about how difficult things have become for young people. So now I'm going to show you a series of uh, photos, actually uh, three photos. And I'll ask you to type your own observation uh, about each of them in the chat box. After that, I'll share the findings of, after each of that, I'll share the findings of a very recent study, okay? So what does research say about um, um, the challenges that teen teens face these days? So when you look at this um, photo, Please think about the challenges that teenagers currently face that this photo reminds you of and, pre and briefly type your thoughts. I have a little problem as I can't see the chat box. Can one of, of my helpers in Cambridge Help me, I don't know what to do. I can't see the chat box now. I can only see the full screen of my, my slides. 
Hi, Herbert. I can help you by reading out some of the answers, if you okay. like. Okay, thank you. So we're getting quite a lot um, being isolated, COVID-19, um, pandemic, isolation, communication, lack of communication, lack of socialising. Um, so along that vein, really. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. I mean, um, look, this, this quotation here comes from a recent study into the negative influence that, as you said, COVID-related problems have on the psychological health of young um, uh, people. They say the COVID-19 pandemic may worsen existing mental health problems and lead to more cases among children and adolescents because of the unique combination of the public health crisis, social isolation, as some of you have said, and economic um, recession. And this is from a study um, carried out in the United States. But I guess this is um, um, uh, uh, pretty much the same. The, the picture we're getting is pretty much the same um, uh, globally. I mean, um, there's been a, a recent study carried out by uh, UNICEF, and they are basically painting the same picture that there's an enormous health uh, burden, mental health burden on, on young people these days. Okay, now let's have a look at, at the next photo. Um, can I ask you again uh, to just type into, into the uh, chat box what your observations are triggered by this photo? And can I ask my my uh, caring helpers in Cambridge to again read out. I'm uh, here. <laughs> Thank you. I'll help you. Um, so we've got bullying, loneliness, social, social isolation because of technology, anxiety caused by social media, uh, desperation, pain, headache, digital obsession, fake relationships, depression, self-comparison. Mm -hmm. Yes. Online life being more important than real life. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's quite amazing, isn't it? That uh, although some people think that, um, you know, the, the prevalence of digital communication um, has actually um, uh, kind of intensified uh, communication among young people. But studies show that this is not necessarily the case as this one uh, this study actually says because of this, many teens lack essential interpersonal communication skills, like knowing how to pick up on social cues. Teens' social media and texting habits are changing the way they communicate, date, learn, sleep, exercise, and more. In fact, the average teen spends over nine hours each day using their electronic um, uh, devices. Well, this may not be nine hours um, uh, for everybody and everywhere, but it is certainly uh, in line with your observations also that um, this obsession with, with um, digital media and social, um, um, uh, social um, communication platforms can actually lead to isolation. And then, of course, on the other hand, because we don't want to, to paint a picture that is uh, about gloom and doom only, um, uh, digital um, technology opens up new um, uh, ways for our young people and can actually help our young people also to develop. So can I ask you to type in a few observations that are in line with this photo here that kind of like depict more the, the positive side of using uh, modern technology? So we've got creativity, experimenting, a way out, critical thinking, teamwork, joy, curiosity, life is fun. Practical yes. skills and teamwork. Yes, teamwork's coming up quite a lot. Challenging Abs activities. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and this is another study saying it is possible that t digital technologies, when used in moderation, and I, th I think that's um, a key word here, 
um, uh, afford measurable advantages to adolescents. These benefits may include avenues for communication, as you said, creativity and um, uh, development. Um, okay, it's, it's time for <laughs> gift giving now. Thinking of your teenage learners and reflecting on the issues that we've just discussed. If you could give them one gift for life, what would that be? Please type your answer in the chat box. So we've got um, solving problems, common sense, <laughs> security, confidence, honesty, resilience, self-esteem and loving themselves, empathy, support, lots of things coming through, gratitude, curious mind, love from their parents, responsibility, joy for every simple thing in life, knowledge, real friends, a book by Dostoevsky, <laughs> self-esteem, confidence, empathy, freedom. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for these answers. I think they provide uh, pretty good evidence of the fact that it is teachers, often more than parents, um, um, that sense a need for what I would call uh, leadership when it comes to the supporting of, of teenagers these days. And one of the best definitions of leadership uh, that I've come across is by Jill Paju, who says that leadership is about creating a world that people want to belong to. And, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the things that you have now mentioned, which I think can be perfectly summed up as, as life skills or, or 21st uh, century um, uh, skills that um, you actually um, mentioned. Well, um, educators have actually frequently asked how they can integrate um, uh, life skills or, or 21st century skills, as I've said, into their English language uh, programs. And in answer to those inquiries, Cambridge University Press and their research department have developed what is called the Cambridge Life Competencies Framework. It's made up of um, uh, six um, competencies. Creative thinking, critical thinking, learning to learn, communication, collaboration, and um, uh, social responsibility. And linked to these um, six competency areas, there are three um, foundation layers. Um, emotional development, that's the one that you can see down there because it's the one that we are going to deal with today in this session um, uh, mainly because we're talking about teenagers' uh, resilience. But uh, there's also digital literacy, of course, very important these days. And um, uh, discipline knowledge, of course, too. We don't want to hide the fact that uh, we are teachers of a language for um, uh, first and foremost. So uh, it's not just about uh, helping young people to, to uh, develop into responsible um, uh, young adults. Um, of course, our main aim is to teach them uh, language successfully. As I've said, we're talking about resilience as one of the vital um, life uh, skills. Uh, it's actually part of young learners' uh, social emotional uh, development. And resilience has been defined as the ability to bounce back from, from stress or from negative emotional experiences. Um, it's quite interesting that initially people thought and researchers thought that resilience is something that certain people have, so like a, a character trait, while other people don't have it, okay? Um, and, and this research was initially, as far as education is concerned, carried out um, um, in, in um, trying to find an answer to the question why 
some at-risk children managed to overcome extremely difficult and extremely challenging life circumstances like poverty, violence, neglect, etc. And they managed to thrive instead of those challenges, while other kids obviously didn't, didn't seem to have that. Um, and, and what um, they clearly found out was that it's not uh, some kind of character uh, trait that we maybe get born with. It's not something that is in our genes, but it's something we can actually, um, as we will see, learn, and it's something we can develop, and it's something that we as teachers can help our learners um, uh, develop. Why should we teach life skills in ELT? Well, these are my main three answers. There's probably more. But my main three answers, first of all, if we combine language learning with learning for life, that makes language learning more meaningful and memorable. The, I mean, Earl Stevig was always talking about depth of um, content. In other words, the more we can get our learners to see what we are teaching them as relevant for their own lives, the more meaningful they will see it and the better, of course, uh, they will uh, remember not only the content, but also the language um, that, that they're learning. The second one has, uh, is intimately tied up with the concept of motivation. Con motivation is uh, basically connected to the question, why? Why am I supposed to learning what uh, you are asking me to learn? If they have a convincing answer to the question, why? Then this is the most powerful uh, motivation uh, for their learning. And, and thirdly, life skills support them in the difficult journey towards um, uh, becoming responsible uh, global um, uh, citizens. And that's, of course, a, a key um, point. Okay, so here we go. These are, I believe, the five things that um, uh, we should know as teachers about um, resilience and at helping young people uh, to develop um, resilience. Well, um, the first one is that I've mentioned this already, resilience is not something that, that um, we either have or don't have. It is something that can be um, learned and um, um, taught um, also, okay? Now, um, this is a quotation that Sarah Mercer recently used in one of her talks on, on global skills. And, and I, I love it. I, I uh, want to use this too. It comes from Nelson Mandela, who says that education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change um, uh, the world. I think it's wonderful as it gets to the very core of what being a teacher is all about. We do not just teach language, um, uh, do we? We have the wonderful opportunity to respectfully influence our uh, teenage learners and help them develop emotional stability and uh, learn to deal with stress, negative emotions, and the inevitable um, adversities that life um, uh, brings about. So that's the first key point. And the second one is that resilience requires connection and it requires, sorry, um, a goal setting. It's influenced both, and that's why connection is so important, by the context and the personal skills and the personal qualities that young people have. Caring relationships uh, play an essential role in developing uh, resilience. And a feeling of safety and belonging at home, of course, also, but especially also in school and in classrooms um, and out in the world. In order for our students to be able to develop resilience, we need to use 
a holistic approach and develop the, the qualities of resilience in ourselves too. So we can develop and plausibly uh, develop a classroom culture of um, resilience. Um, this is why, of course, student well-being is so important. And this is not always about being serious, serious, serious. It's also about enjoying life. Uh, it's about um, uh, being healthy. It's about having hobbies. It's about making friends. It's um, about sleeping. Um, it's about a good night's sleep. All these um, activities are so extremely important for our young people. And this is why, for example, um, we have, of course, also in the second edition of, of Superminds, these questionnaires that help young people to explore certain values. And then if you look at the uh, lower part of the screen, go into discussing values among each other in class and, and um, explore values and learn from one another by comparing their um, uh, values. This um, is about um, a flog, and I will come back to this a little bit later. The series is called um, life lessons or life competences. Um, and this is six um, such uh, video blogs, flogs in each um, level of, of uh, uh, Think Second Edition, where um, young people, um, in, in a pretty cool way, talk about certain very, very important uh, life skills, like in this particular case here, achieving goals, something that is so important and also intimately tied up with um, uh, developing um, um, resilience, of course. Um, so I will, I will be talking about this a little bit later, but what I would like to stress is that um, we have uh, developed or extended the self-esteem activities into whole page life skills um, 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 uh, development, uh, uh, a set of activities, as you can see here, with, with very, very practical uh, and easy to follow steps um, uh, for uh, students, okay? Now, the next one, what we should know about uh, resilience is that it equips people with the stamina to keep going when the going gets tough, okay? It helps to protect them from feeling overwhelmed and helpless. This is um, a very, very important um, uh, point. Um, and I, I mean, um, it has, it's intimately tied up with the question of, with, with the concepts of, of grit uh, Angela Duckworth, uh, it's a concept that Angela Duckworth um, uh, developed, and, and then um, Kel S. Uh, Dweck's concept of growth mindsets, okay? And one thing um, Carol S. Dweck points out that growth mindsets, believing that we can achieve in spite of maybe negative experiences sometimes, that is something, again, we can learn. We can learn it, for example, by changing our beliefs and how we talk about negative experiences. And one strategy um, is called the power of yet. And I personally discovered the power of yet when I was a teacher of young learners many, many years ago. And I interviewed um, in a research project a young learner, I think she was eight or nine years, years old. Her name was Barbara. Barbara was the kind of student that we would like to have hundreds of in our classes. Um, lovely girl, excellent at English. And she was particularly good at remembering chunks of language and, and, and words her teacher um, was using. And she immediately tried them out. 
And I wanted to know from her, what kind of beliefs was she going to use in moments when she couldn't remember a chunk of uh, language or, or a phrase or a word? And I said to her, okay, now let's say you can't remember a word or a phrase, even if you try very hard. What do you do then? And Barbara, the eight-year-old girl, started to laugh and said, that doesn't matter. And I went, it doesn't matter? What do you mean? Well, it doesn't matter if I can't do it now. And I said, uh-huh. And she said, yeah, then I just tell myself one day I'll be able to do it. It doesn't matter that I'm not able to do it now yet. One day I'll be able to do it. I'm sure I will. That was long before I read the literature on growth mindsets. But um, what she is referring to here is the power of yet. And this is something that we also have in a reading text in, in um, Think Second Edition. I will be giving uh, another seminar, by the way, on uh, reading and listening in the Think Second Edition um, in a few weeks' time. Um, we'll share the, the uh, date with you a bit later. Um, uh, this is a text about the power of yet. Helps teenagers to become aware that negative experiences and failure can actually be overcome if I develop um, um, a belief um, that it's fine to make mistakes because... Um, uh, we need to make mistakes when we learn. And one way of doing that is using the chunk, not yet. Okay, right. And this is something that this gentleman here was actually referring to in Hamlet, saying for it, there is nothing either good or bad. Thinking makes it so. It's what we think about our own failure, whether we see it as a terrible failure that where, where we can't do anything about it, or we see it as something that is part of our learning. Point number four, building resilience requires social emotional learning. I've mentioned already um, student well-being and how important um, student well-being is. The cell social emotional learning is something that is um, a part of this um, whole range of um, um, support systems that we can and uh, need to use. Okay, so one of the key social emotional learning competences for the teacher is to accept our students' feelings. Um, adolescents, in particular, and teenage years. I've mentioned this are about a roller coaster emotional experience. Okay, they are um, extremely happy one moment and they are almost depressed the next. And it's not always easy for us to show them that we accept their feelings, but also to show them that we understand how how they feel, especially. Um, um, at, you know, certain times when they express um, pretty strongly how they feel. And this is something I developed some time ago. Um, and, and I'm using an example that some of you may have, have seen me use once, but I think it's worth uh, repeating this. Now imagine a student saying to you, we've got a math test next week. And now you're giving us so much homework. And especially if it comes um, uh, delivered um, <laughs> as indicated in this photo, it's maybe not always easy to be tolerant and understanding and caring and, and you know, as having the empathy that we want to have. There are times when, when being a teacher, as we all know, can be extremely uh, difficult. It's not only our learners who are stressed, it's, it's us um, uh, too. So it, it wouldn't be uh, a surprise if a teacher answered along the lines of, you should have started studying for that test earlier. 
then the homework I'm giving you wouldn't be any problem whatsoever. Well, the problem is, of course, the teacher in right, is right in what he is saying here. But in order for us to create the rapport that we should create with our students, it, it is actually better to stick to our guns, so to speak. So we, we can't, you know, whenever a student um, angrily reminds us of the fact that they have a maths homework, uh, a, a maths test too, and therefore we shouldn't give them um, uh, English homework. We cannot always give in. There, there are reasons why, why we want them to do homework. But, you know, showing them that we understand how they feel and then giving them a clear reason why we need to stick to what we have actually asked them to do. So identifying thoughts and feelings like this teacher um, is doing this here. Sounds like you're pulled in two directions. You want to make sure you write a good maths test. So uh, those are the thoughts. But you don't want to disappoint me either by not doing it homework I've, I've uh, just given you. That's the emotional side of the thing. And by taking the two uh, apart, try this out. I think this has good takeaway uh, value. Uh, that helps enormously to, to support your student in a, in students in a moment when they become very emotional and a bit overwhelmed with, with uh, stress. Uh, another um, uh, possibility is acknowledging their feelings and at the same time redirecting their behavior. Like, for example, the teacher here who says, I hear that you really don't want to do this English homework. So I'm, I, I hear that, okay? I acknowledge your feelings. The problem is... But as we're going to start the next lesson with all of you reading out each other's texts, your story will need to be done by then. So the teacher clearly says why she needs them to do this homework. And at the same time, she says, well, I understand you don't want to do the, the homework. She's, she's non-judgmental about that. So um, maybe you want to try out these two uh, tips, identifying thoughts and feelings and acknowledging feelings as you um, redirect um, their behavior. I've already mentioned uh, these uh, life skills uh, vlogs that we have in um, the second edition of, of Think. I would like to um, briefly sort of um, go through the structure because I think this is a good structure in terms of helping young people become aware of the need of certain competencies and um, supporting them in exploring them and in taking them on board. We start out, and I'll play you one of the vlogs in a minute. I'm, I'm not going to play this one. This is from level one. We start out with students watching uh, a vlog, one of those uh, podcasts, so to speak, and um, we're giving them some comprehension um, questions. So in this case, um, the, the uh, competence area is dealing with negative feelings. We're giving them these questions here as comprehension questions, basically, to support uh, their, their linguistic understanding. Then they are reading a text. And um, uh, this text, sorry, I've blocked out the upper right part of the, this image. There's not such a white thing in there just to, to make you, um, just not to have this, this uh, tips um, section here in the on the same slide, okay? I'll show you the tips section in a minute. So they read this text. This is about a young person, um, James, um, talking about his relationship with his brother. Uh, who we, he has a good relationship with, but sometimes they fight and it can get quite bad. And he's analyzing what happens here. Students are asked um, questions. So they look at this situation. First of all, comprehension questions. And then um, uh, uh, can you think of more good actions to do when you are angry? And me and my world, think of three things for each list, then compare with a partner. 
things that make me feel negative, things I do when I'm feeling negative, things I should do when I'm feeling negative. So, so we're going from um, the advice they hear on this floor from a young person um, uh, towards reading a text by another young person talking about uh, their problems uh, with, with uh, their brother, and then they are referring it to, to their own um, uh, situation. And finally, some concrete tips about what to do when uh, dealing with negative feelings. And here's one example, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can um, hear this all right. I'll, I won't play you the whole um, uh, video, obviously. I will um, play the, the first uh, few minutes, maybe. Okay. Um, this one is actually about being supportive. So supporting uh, each other is an extremely important friendship uh, quality and something that helps to build resilience. Okay, here we go. Hi, it's Will. Welcome to Life Lessons. That's better. Hi there. There's a reason why I was in that box. You've heard of the expression thinking outside of the box, haven't you? Well, I thought I'd try it out, and to be honest, while I was in that box, I couldn't think of anything except, get me out of this box. So, now that I'm outside of the box, hopefully my thinking will be clearer. So, I hear you ask, what is that problem, Will, that got you into that box in the first place? That is a good question, and really it's what today's lesson is all about. So, maybe just forget all that box stuff. The problem. My best friend Max wants to be an artist. He spends hours and hours every day painting. The problem is that no one thinks his paintings are very good. I have a couple here that he gave me, so you can make up your own mind. Hmm. What to do? I am his very, very best friend. Do I tell him the truth? No. If I'm a good friend, I need to be supportive. It's his passion. I have to imagine how I'd feel if someone told me I was the world's worst vlogger. What? I am. Really? <laughs> no, you see, that doesn't feel good. What? You were just kidding. You love my vlog. Oh, well, thank you. That's really nice to hear. Thanks for your support. Now that felt a whole lot better. It's important to be supportive. If your best friend isn't there for you, then who will be? But then shouldn't a best friend also be honest? Maybe if someone told me gently that maybe I should give up vlogging, it wouldn't be so bad? Oh, oh really? I think I should look for a new hobby. No, that still feels bad. I definitely preferred it when you were being supportive. So, you see what my dilemma is? How can I best be supportive in this tricky situation? And that's why I was in the box. Actually, that's not true. I was only in the box to entertain you. I had already done my thinking outside of the box. And I think I've come up with an idea. Let me run it past you. I think the solution might be to get Max to change his style. Okay, I stop it. I'll stop it here. I'm sorry. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. In the meantime, I've managed to get my, my chat box um, <laughs> back. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so uh, number five uh, is, of course, that building resilience is especially important for teens as it supports them in transiting from, from childhood, uh, childhood towards adulthood. And, and this is a key point here. 
So um, I hope you you like this this uh, this this vlog, this is an example of a vlog. The idea here is these are cool young people giving this advice. Uh, they're giving very practical advice, so they could become potentially become sort of role models. And um, we have six in each level of, of um, Think Second Edition. So um, before we started working on the second edition, of course, Cambridge carried out um, a, a lot of research in all the countries around the world where Think um, uh, has been um, uh, used um, and is being used. And one of the things we got back as feedback is, we want um, um, more uh, real life videos. I'll show you one in a minute also. And uh, we want also these kind of like new um, uh, uh, video formats reflected in the course, such as um, uh, videos produced by young people, uh, vlogs, as, as you could see in, the, in these examples here, okay? Um, uh, Peggy is saying that um, she thinks that teens can relate to these topics in the vlogs. L let me read out to you a, a number of the topics we have here. So A2 level includes, um, for example, as I said, six per level. A2 includes, among other things, empathy, saying sorry, helping others and dealing with negative feelings. In B1, we have, among other things, achieving your goals taking responsibility for your actions, being assertive, B2, managing stress, being determined, getting along with others, okay? So um, these were, this, or this was just one example. They've been uh, done, I think, um, uh, uh, in, in, in an excellent way. And we have shown them to young people, of course, and uh, their reactions are very, very, very um, uh, positive. I said previously, of course, um, we want to create a classroom culture of can-do, and um, um, this can-do includes also a can-do concerning uh, topics that are not always uh, so positive, like, for example, um, the environment. So rather than saying in our texts that everything is bad, we want to show examples of initiatives um, uh, where um, people have actually found green solutions around the world. So they read a text here um, uh, on, on three um, examples of green solutions, one coming from the Netherlands, one from Ecuador, and one from um, uh, Mexico. And we lead um, into this by um, giving you um, a, a culture video that you can play before um, you, you get them to watch, uh, to read, sorry. Um, this or these texts. Let me just play a brief excerpt from the from the video. Twenty fifteen, Sikkim, located in northeast India, becomes the first a hundred percent organic state in the world. All of its farmland is certified organic. This not only improves the quality of the soil and the food, but it prevents water pollution too. September 2018, young Dutch inventor Boyan Slat starts ocean cleanup. His solution to help clean up the sea. The system catches and collects the plastic that is floating in the water. By 2032, the Danish island Bornholm will be one of the first litter-free communities on the planet. Okay, and um, uh, so on. Let me just go to the... To they the are trying to reuse... Slide, okay. Now, um, this is... Um, these are the covers of the new edition of Think. 
and I'm giving back to um, Charlotte. I'd just like to, to say thank you so much for participating so actively. And I'm looking forward to dealing with your, with your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert, for a really interesting session. Um, I particularly picked up on the power of yet, actually. That was something that I found extremely interesting. So um, yes, I'm going to go away and mull on that a little bit further. Um, so we're going to dive into some of the questions you've been putting in the Q&A box. Um, and we've got quite a few here, actually. So um, one of the first questions, Herbert, that we've had was, from Faras, which is how to deal with a student's response when they say, I don't know, and I don't care. Okay, well, um, if it's I don't know, um, then I would ask what it is that the students doesn't know. Uh, if it's I don't care, um, sounds to me without, without uh, having been in that situation with your learners, that this might be, and this is the case sometimes with teenagers, um, that a teenager wants to be a bit provocative, maybe. Um, I would not always address this in front of the whole class. I would um, ask uh, the learner um, uh, for a chat. Um, and I would say, well, you said today that you don't care. So it sounds to me that that you're actually very frustrated or you're pretty much fed up um, uh, would you like to share with me what it is that you don't care about or what it is that frustrates you so much so i would try and and signal to the learner i'm taking you seriously please tell me more okay great thank you um and then we've had another question here about uh, from Peggy saying sometimes not often I take a step back when students tell me they haven't got time to do homework and I may give a little less when it's exam time am I wrong to do so thank you no you're absolutely right to do so I didn't want to give the impression that we should always stick to our guns uh, we shouldn't always give in uh, there are times um, when we need to give in and I think, you know, this will just um, show to your students that you care. And, and so I totally agree with you. Okay. Um, and then we've got a question here just about, this is around the actual course itself. So it's asking about um, the life competency sections and whether they replace the old, I think you mean the photo stories, dramas from the first yes. edition and whether yes. they're in, in each unit. Um, now they're in every other unit, aren't they, Herbert, the life competencies? Yes, pages. the life yeah. competencies are in every other unit. As far as the, the drama connected to the photo stories is concerned, um, I have to confess, uh, I was a little bit disappointed because the feedback we got on Think um, in general was so good, but, but the, the drama uh, videos were not extremely, um, uh, um, pe people didn't like, or, or some colleagues were not extremely enthusiastic about them. So we have actually, we're not using them in the, in the second um, edition. And uh, somebody else who asked in the chat, um, the example you showed of the documentaries from the actual course, isn't it? So yes, that yes. is an actual video, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then we've got some other questions here. So you spoke about the importance of goal setting. Yes. My students find it easy to set goals, but when it comes to achieving their long-term goals in particular, they tend to fail. Any suggestions? Yeah, that's... that's um, I a very good question, actually. Um, the research into goal setting shows that um, when students set long-term goals, we should always make sure they also set the short-term goals that lead them to the long-term goals. Because the problem with long-term goals, if I don't set myself short-term goals at the same time, is that I get no feedback of success. If I work towards a long-term goal, then how do I notice that I'm getting closer to my goal? So we need to split up um, uh, long-term goals into, into short-term uh, goals. That's, 
that is a key and also it's worth thinking about possible obstacles that I might meet on the way towards um, um, uh, uh, working on, on these long-term uh, uh, goals. And I might already think now, well, if, if I meet this or that ob obstacle, what could I do in order to overcome it? Okay. Um, okay, so another question here. When it comes to student well-being, I think a sense of humor would come very come in very handy and I'm not a born comedian <laughs> um, so is there something we can do to make sure we have fun with our students every now and then yeah thanks thanks so much for this question a very important question um, fun um, laughter uh, releases um, uh, uh, hormones that actually help to to overcome stress and it releases, it, it actually it helps to fight tension. So laughing with our students, not all the time, but occasionally, and occasionally laughing about ourselves is important. Now, like you, I'm not a born comedian, but I like a good laugh. So occasionally, I mean, in my, in my very recent book, um, uh, Herbert Puchter's 101 Tips for Teaching Teenagers. I suggest that, you know, occasionally you come into classroom with a silly slogan, a T-shirt with a silly slogan on it, and you will notice the surprises on their, on their faces, and you can laugh uh, with them about that. Or you take a particularly um, um, strange pair of sunglasses or what have you, or you tell them a joke and when they don't find it funny, which is uh, very likely, you say, well, I don't understand that because whenever I tell a joke, people normally roll on the floor with laughter. So something like that. And then you join in and you laugh about yourself. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we are not born comedians, but at least we can try to be funny every now and then. Um, so we've had a couple more questions. I think we've got just time for a couple more. Um, so Chester has asked, how can I maintain students' motivation? Good question. By, by using um, uh, the kind of, for by turning the activities that I've shown and the ideas that I've shown into an attitude and by not using such things as a gimmick, but by helping uh, uh, with the development of student well-being as an ongoing um, uh, process, by um, uh, giving them a continuous why in the in the foreign language class that helps them uh, to be motivated, and also by accepting that we are not magicians there are times when we fail maybe there are times when um in spite of of uh, you know whatever or however carefully we plan our lesson sometimes we will fail and we have to accept that too and we have to be tolerant um, uh, about that towards ourselves mm -hmm. Um, I've got a question here about writing, actually, Herbert, that I'd like to um, put to you. So the question is, my teenage students always struggle with writing, but mm -hmm. they do their best to develop the skill. I find the tips in the first edition useful. What about the second edition? Has anything been changed or added in the writing parts? Um, you, well, um, I think but I'm not quite sure now. I think we have extended the writing sections. We, we definitely haven't shortened them down. If you like them in the first edition, you will not find um, uh, fewer, uh, supp uh, less support uh, when it comes to developing students' writing. Um, I, I think we've actually upped um, the, the writing support that you, that you find in the course. And you can certainly go and see samples on the website, so you can actually look at actual samples from all the books. So um, we'll tip. direct you to the to the website at the end of the session. So yeah, you can definitely That's go and have tip. a look. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I've got one more question here, which I think we can squeeze in, which is about um, how can we deal with students who have high anxiety in expressing ideas in English? 
So does the book or the course lead us to activities which can encourage students to bravely speak up? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, we, we are doing a lot to help you give your students emotional support. Um, when there are students who, who are shyer, who are a bit introvert, who don't want to speak out in front of everybody else, we have um, uh, classroom management uh, in terms of breaking them up into, into pairs, in terms of getting them to work, work in, in, in smaller groups. And, and that is, or those are very, very important stages towards helping them to, to speak out uh, publicly, publicly. Not everybody likes talking in front of a whole class. Sometimes um, there are limits to what we can achieve, but I'm totally convinced that, that our students um, uh, can learn to um, speak uh, and communicate uh, through pair work and, and group work too. And of course, as, as uh, a supportive teacher, we will walk around and we will uh, praise them and give them positive feedback. And this is how we can gradually uh, lead them towards maybe uh, being a bit more uh, courageous. We will not easily turn a very introvert student into an extrovert um, one, of course. Okay. Well, I think that's about all we've got time for today, unfortunately, because we're nearly at four o'clock um, UK time. So thank you so much, Herbert, um, for an absolutely brilliant session. And we hope that all of you can join us for the next two webinars on Think Second Edition, which are both at 3 p.m. UK time. And I'm just going to give you the dates now for your diary. Um, the 17th of March, we have Herbert back again, which is great. Um, and he's going to be talking about um, of daredevils, human moles and bugs for lunch. Five things to know about teaching your teens reading and listening. So do make sure you register for that one. Um, and the second, um, the second one, or the third one in our series, if you like, is the 21st of April. And that's with another speaker, Mark Meredith, who will be talking on waking up from webinar fatigue, five things to know about motivating your team. So please do, um, you see the link in the chat, you can sign up for those webinars and please do join us for the next two webinars as well. Don't forget as well that you can also visit the Think Second Edition hub on our website at cambridge.org forward slash Think Second Edition. We'll put that in the chat for you as well. And you can download samples there and you can see all the components of the new course. And of course, you can always talk to your Cambridge representative. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Herbert, for another brilliant session. Um, thank you, everyone. And goodbye.